Whose woods these are? I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of the easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. My friends, we gather today in woods deep and dark, but alas, not lovely. The dark wood of epidemic obesity in adults and children alike, the dark wood of epidemic diabetes, the dark wood in which what used to be adult onset diabetes is now routinely diagnosed in children under the age of 10 and called type 2. The dark wood in which I can tell you the case of a 17-year-old boy who's had a triple coronary bypass. The dark wood which, if we don't escape, will give us adolescent angina as a rite of passage alongside acne. A dark wood in which it was recently reported that there's been a 35% increase in the rate of stroke among 5 to 14-year-olds due to epidemic childhood obesity. A dark wood we must escape. We, too, have miles to go. We, too, have promises to keep, or rather one great promise, the luminous promise of lifestyle to public health and the human condition. Prior to 1993, when we talked about the leading causes of premature death in our society, the things that take years from life and more importantly, perhaps, life from years, the only correct list of answers was diseases. Heart disease is the number one killer, cancer is number two, stroke is number three, arguably diabetes is number four. That has been it, the way of it for decades. Still the way of it. But in 1993, Two epidemiologists published a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. What Bill Fagy and Mike McGinnis thought to point out should have been obvious all along. Diseases are not causes. Diseases are effects. And what we really wanted to know was what was causing the diseases that were taking years from life and life from years? What was really in the way? as we try to get to the prize, the prize of vitality, good quality of life. Well, they crunched the relevant numbers and told us a list of 10 factors which overwhelmingly we control in our daily lives was accountable for virtually all of the premature deaths that occur in our country. And that list of 10, the full extent of which need not concern us today, was in turn overwhelmingly dominated by just the first three, tobacco use, dietary pattern, and physical activity. About 80% of the action was there. Well, 1993 is getting to be an old vintage. We have fresher data. Ten years later, scientists at the CDC reanalyzed this issue and reached exactly the same conclusion. Bad use of feet, forks, and fingers were still the leading causes of premature death in our society. All that had changed over the span of a decade is that the gap between tobacco is number one and bad diet and lack of physical activity in combination as number two had narrowed. Partly for a good reason, strides against the use of tobacco. Partly for a bad, deteriorating dietary patterns. Less physical activity, worse obesity, worse diabetes. Other voices began to say, you know, maybe there's an opportunity here. If these are the leading causes of premature death, if we turn them around, might they not be the leading causes of renewed vitality, of new opportunity? In 2009, a group of scientists at the CDC conducted survey research among 23,000 adults in and around Potsdam, Germany. They asked these 23,000 people about four ostensible behaviors. They asked them, do you smoke, yes or no? Do you eat well, yes or no, habitual intake of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains? Are you physically active on a regular basis, yes or no? 
And do you control your weight, yes or no? And that last one is why I say ostensible behaviors. Weight is not a behavior. Weight is not a choice. Nobody wakes up and decides what to weigh. To the extent that weight is governed by factors we control, it's governed by diet and physical activity, already on the list, calories in and calories out. But to the extent that weight is not governed by those two forces, it's governed by forces we do not control. Our genetic endowment, our ethnic heritage, our resting energy expenditure, perhaps the microbiome of our intestinal tract. We must acknowledge no one gets to decide what to weigh, even if they decide to eat well and be physically active. But I digress. Ford and colleagues asked about these four factors, and then they compared the extremes of the, the spectrum. They compared, I eat well, I don't smoke, I'm physically active, my weight is under control, to I eat poorly, I smoke, I don't exercise, and my weight is out of control. These people had an 80% lesser likelihood over the course of their lives of developing any major chronic disease than these people. Flip the switch on any one of these factors from bad to good, and the likelihood of any major chronic disease goes down fully 50%. But fire on just these four cylinders, and the likelihood of any major chronic disease over the span of your life goes down 80%. Now imagine if the news were to break tomorrow that there's a new pill available by prescription which is remarkably free of side effects, relatively inexpensive, safe enough for children and octogenarians alike, and if you take it daily, it will reduce your risk of ever getting any major chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, etc., by 80%. What would you do first? Rush out for that prescription or call your broker so you can invest in the company that owns the patent on that stuff? Both would be excellent ideas, but for the fact that there is no such pill. There never will be any such pill. But for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren, lifestyle is that medicine. If you happen not to like Potsdam or you like your data fresher still, we have them. Replication of these findings a little over a year ago in the United Kingdom and yet again just a few months back here in the U.S. Essentially a repetitive drumbeat in the medical literature telling us about the power of lifestyle over medical destiny. And the beat of this drum reverberates to our very pith and marrow. We're now a decade into the dawn of the genomic age, and we find ourselves debating whether the greater power center resides with nature or with nurture. The reality is we can nurture nature. This is a study involving 30 men with early stage prostate cancer, amenable to watchful waiting. But rather than simply watch and wait, this group of investigators put these men on an intensive lifestyle program, the cornerstone of which was an optimal plant-based diet, good levels of physical activity, of course, tobacco avoidance, all the good stuff you've been hearing about. And then the study examined not the men, and not the cancer in the men, but rather the genes in the men with the cancer. And the power of lifestyle was such that 500 cancer promoter genes were dramatically downregulated by this intervention, 50 cancer suppressor genes were dramatically upregulated. Lifestyle is such good medicine that it can refashion our fate at the very level of our genes. We can, in fact, nurture nature. And this literature is growing very rapidly. So I think the case can be made, indeed I dare hope that the case has been made, that the master levers of medical destiny are feet, forks, and fingers. And you know what Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough and I can move the whole world. Well, make no mistake, these levers in our hands are long enough. We should long since have moved the whole world of modern public health to a better place. But, alas, we like to contend that knowledge is power. The gap between what we know and what we do with what we know belies it. We have known these 20 years or more that feet, forks, and fingers are the master levers of medical destiny. We have failed to heave home. We have failed to turn what we know into what we do. And so the miles we must traverse to fulfill our promises are the miles between knowledge and power. Now what if knowledge were power? 
What if we mustered the will and found the way to turn what we have known these 20 years into what we routinely do? Well, then I could say to you, we could prevent 80% of all heart disease going forward. We could prevent 90% of all diabetes. We could prevent 60% of all cancer. I could say this to you and I could cite literature to back me up. In fact, you know what? I am saying this to you. I am citing literature to back me up. And what I want to know is in doing so, have I brought a tear to any eye or a lump to any throat? Any tears? A lump, perhaps. What a tearless, lumpless, insensitive mob you are. I'm appalled. No, not really. These, in fact, are among the most stunning statistics in the history of public health, and they are verifiably true. But they are statistics. They are dull, they are dry, they are bland, and they are anonymous. It's very hard to care about the public health because the public is nameless. The public is faceless. We don't hear the sound of love when we think about the public. But in fact, there is no public. There's just you and me and everybody else. And I need your help. I need you to help me help you help me help you see the private parts of public health so we can, in fact, hear the sound of love, so we can feel passion about this cause. If you or someone you love has been affected by heart disease, would you kindly raise your hand and keep it in the air, please? Keep your hand in the air. Anyone too damn lazy to keep their hand in the air? The exit is back that way. If you or someone you love has been affected by cancer and your hand's not in the air, please add your hand to those in the air. And if you or someone you love has been affected by stroke or diabetes, please add your hand to those in the air if not already up. And folks, if you wouldn't mind, please look around the auditorium. And as you look around and see a sea of raised hands, you can lower your hands, I'll be your proxy. Conjure to your mind's eye that day, the day you got that phone call or made that trip to the hospital. And I hope that loved one got off that gurney and came home. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But either way, it was a terrible day. It was a dreadful day. And everybody in this room has experienced it. Now consider this, if what we have known these 20 years or what we found a way to turn into what we routinely do, eight out of 10 of us in this very room would not have had cause to raise our hands. Make no mistake, the peril we discuss today is clear and omnipresent. It has invaded all of our homes and all of our families. This is not about some anonymous public. This is up close and it's personal. When we part the veil of statistical anonymity, the faces we see looking back at us are the faces of people we love. It is for them we must fulfill the promise. It is for them we must traverse the miles. And it is because of them we have cause to ask after 20 years, have we been traversing the miles as required? Have we been following the right road to the prize, vitality, more years in life, more life in years for ourselves and for children? Children who potentially stand to be the first generation in history with a projected life expectancy shorter than their parents because of these preventable issues. We have cause to ask if we're following the right road because the road taken can make all the difference. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wooden eye. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Well, alas, health lies on the road less traveled, and the road we find ourselves on looks like this. Folks, we need a new road. And talking about will will not get the job done. We say knowledge is power. I contend it is untrue. We also say where there's a will, there's a way, and that too is wishful thinking. 
We need both will and way. We must cultivate will and pave the way. Sometimes that paving is literal, involving paving stones. We can build sidewalks and bike lanes and linear parks and make it easier to get to the prize. And the literature tells us there is widespread support for that very undertaking. But sometimes the paving must be figurative. We will not pave our way back to a Stone Age environment anytime soon, at least not intentionally. So we need to think about power and responsibility. The Spider-Man movies, I trust you're a highly cultured audience and have all seen them, the Spider-Man movies give us the adage, with great power comes great responsibility. The corollary to that, of course, is before we can ask anyone, before we can ask our children to take responsibility for health, we must make sure they are empowered. Part of we must, what we must build is the requisite skill set. We speak of willpower. We must also speak of skill power. We need to cultivate will and then pave the way with the relevant skills so people can get to the prize, so our kids can get to the prize. When we do the necessary paving, we can shift health from the road not taken to a path of lesser resistance. I'll be back later today to tell you how to get that job done. For now, I thank you very much.